Hi, this is Kelsey Fukowski for AP Gov Review, and in Part 5 of Congress in Unit 4, we'll be looking at one of the most important things that Congress does, and that, of course, is the legislative function. And if you recall from previous videos, of course, there are two major functions of Congress. The first, as I just mentioned, being legislation, and the second one being legislative oversight. So in this video, we're going to be looking specifically as how a bill becomes law. This is really Congress's baby, if you will. This is the main function of what Congress does. It's what Congress is most well known for, despite what you see on the right-hand side of this political cartoon here. But nevertheless, a bill in its simplest definition is simply a proposed law. And I would also encourage you, if you still need additional clarity as to how a bill becomes a law, really, the I'm Just a Bill Schoolhouse Rock video on YouTube is really an excellent uh, piece of education um, that will certainly set you up uh, for answering questions correctly on the AP Gov exam. But nevertheless, every year, approximately, you have about 11,000 bills introduced Again, because you only have so many members, you only have so much time and space on the legislative agenda, only 5% become law. And again, that's on average, a mere 5% of 11,000. Now, anyone can draft a bill within Congress. However, it has to be a congressperson. It cannot be the president. I repeat, a president cannot introduce a bill. However, any member of Congress certainly can. The judicial branch cannot do it. Again, only members of Congress. Now, as we talked about when we were looking at the structure of the House versus the Senate, there are many more rules in the House. It is uh, much more structured as opposed to the Senate, so do know that. Party leaders, of course, are going to be playing a major role in steering bills through the Houses, um, especially uh, in the House of Representatives, but a little bit less in the Senate. Um, and especially when we were talking about with the House of Representatives, remember all bills are going to need to start, all tax bills, all purposes dealing with taxation, have to start in the Ways and Means Committee, if you recall. And again, that's in the House of Representatives. Now, during the process of a bill becoming a law, there are many, many different influences, as we've talked about in earlier videos, that of course being interest groups, lobbyists, and even the president can certainly be a major role in determining if a bill is going to pass or if it's going to get, as we've talked about, pigeonholed. But in this figure 12.2, this sort of in a, in a good, concise way really defines as to how a bill is going to become law. For the AP Gov exam, you're simply going to need to know this, nothing beyond really this particular structure. So if you can sort of know off the top of your head as to the process of a bill becoming law, you should be okay. You're not looking for the nitty-gritty intricacies of how a bill becomes a law, but certainly if you know the process where it starts in one chamber of a Congress being the House or the, the Senate, you're going to be okay. So let me give you an overview and then I'll go into it a little bit more in depth. So of course the bill is going to start in the House or the Senate and it's going to be assigned to a subcommittee. And within the subcommittee they are going to research that bill and then they're going to vote on it. And if it gets out of subcommittee, it will then go to the committee in which that committee will then vote on it. If it is lucky enough to get out of committee, it will then go to the leadership of the Senate or the rules committee in the House. Remember, the House only has a rules committee because it's more structured. And there you'll have formalized rules. And if it is lucky enough, it will be scheduled for a vote for the full House or the full Senate. Upon it passing in both the House as well as the Senate, once both houses are going to pass it, it will then go into the conference committee. The conference committee is where, of course, the bill is going to get hashed out, and ultimately it's going to produce a compromise bill, and then the House and the Senate will vote on it again. Upon passing the Senate as well as the full House, it will then go to the president, and the president has the option of signing that bill, in which it would eventually become law, or can veto it. If the bill, of course, is vetoed, it will take two-thirds of the House and the Senate to override the President's veto to become law. Again, that was a very quick overview. Let's go into it a little bit more in depth. So as we said earlier, that any member of Congress can introduce a bill, and then once the bill has been proposed and introduced, the congressional leadership is going to assign the bill to the committee. And remember, committees is really are where the real work of Congress is done. 
you will have oftentimes have the committee that's going to mark up the bill. It's going to add changes. It's going to revise it. It's going to admit some uh, things that they don't necessarily like. And again, a lot of this can come down to party politics. So if it is a new tax, typically you might, let's say, have conservative members trying to omit that tax or try to decrease the tax. Nevertheless, at the subcommittees, are going to be holding public hearings, are going to be obtaining evidence, are going to be conducting research. However, most bills are pigeonholed. They are tabled in which they're either forgotten about or they never make it into the committee. Again, you only have so much time with 11,000 different bills. You only have so much time. So once it gets out of the committee, if it gets out of committee, which most bills do die there, definitely be aware of that, uh, it is then voted on the committee and sent to the rules committee in the House of Representatives, or if it originated in the Senate, it would go for a direct vote in the Senate if the Senate Majority Leader says so. Again, a lot of power in terms of the people who are in charge. Now, let's say the bill originated in the House, of course, after it gets out of committee, it would then go to the House Rules Committee. That's, of course, where it's going to review bills before going to the full House for a vote. Now, of course, each bill has a rule. It allots a certain amount of time for debate. Uh, in which different members of Congress and different political parties can, again, debate the bill, the merits of the bill, whether the bill should pass, whether the bill should not pass, or whatever things they want to say. They can also determine what types of amendments. So if you're dealing with a particular bill, you can add something onto it, which is known as an amendment. In addition, uh, close rules uh, in terms of uh, the gag rule, which might forbid amendments on the floor. It might also impose very strict time limits. Most tend to be closed, FYI. In terms of open rule, this would permit amendments uh, and typically less time limits. Amendments that you're going to add must be germane, meaning they have to relate to the bill. So if your bill is dealing with agriculture and then you try to attack, attach something on or amend something to that on uh, that, let's say, has to do with homeland security, that would not be germane. So you would not be allowed to do that because, again, in the House, it's much more formalized. Now, there are things called discharge petitions in which you get 218 members of the floor uh, to get rid of the bill. That can happen. But again, most of the time, you don't see that being used. And then lastly, a quorum must be present for voting, which means you just have a simple majority. So let's say you only had 15 people on the House floor, you would need a quorum. So 15, obviously, of 435 would not be a simple majority. That is to ensure that there are enough people present before voting. So the House Rules Committee, as you can tell by its name, is adding rules. Each bill has a rule. And again, this can impede the flow. This can also uh, ex, uh, expedite it. So think of the House Rules Committee in, in many ways as the traffic cop of legislation in the House of Representatives. So let me just go back to that chart one more time, just to give you another visual. So if we were in the House, it passes through committee, it would go to the Rules Committee. If you're in the Senate, it goes to the committee. If, assuming that it passes, then the leadership would schedule it for a vote if the leader wants the bill to uh, proceed. Now, in the Senate, where bills might originate, the Senate is a little bit uh, more interesting in the, in the sense that it was for, formed originally to protect the elite interests and temper the House, to sort of cool it off. So if the House, which of course was elected by the public, had some extreme bill, the idea was that the Senate, which at the, this time prior to the 17th Amendment was uh, made of, of senators who were appointed by the state legislature, could temper the House, they could stall the bill. And this is a unique uh, feature of the Senate, which is known as a filibuster, where you have unlimited debates in the Senate, and that would prevent the Senate from voting on a bill. The House of Representatives does not have a filibuster. The Senate does. Now, the only way to get uh, around the filibuster is if 60 members of the Senate invoke what is called cloture, where if they want to halt that filibuster, you need 60. But think about how difficult 60 is. And oftentimes, you don't necessarily have a political party in the Senate that has 60 voting members of their party to invoke cloture. So that is very difficult. So sometimes even just the threat of a filibuster is enough to derail legislation. Also, with respect to bills in the Senate, amendments and riders, this allows add-ons. They do not necessarily have to be germane, unlike the House. And when there are many things attached, uh, you have what's known as a Christmas tree bill in which it just sounds like it is, uh, a bill that attracts many often unrelated floor amendments. So almost in a way, senators are getting their wish to get a, a rider or an amendment attached onto a bill regardless 
of whether or not it's germane. So oftentimes you might have bills that have many riders or amendments attached to it. And a person might, you know, like one aspect of the bill that they deem to be very good, but another aspect that might be a rider that's really awful, and then they have to ultimately wind up voting against the bill. So it can be very, very difficult, as you see by these political cartoons here. Now, some criticisms of Congress. Um, typically, there is what is known as pork, where there are benefits for members' districts. A good example of that was the famous Bridge to Nowhere, where there was $200 million allocated, known as pork. So when you have money allocated or benefits allocated for members' district, that's known as pork. But in this case, it was $200 million for a bridge for 9,000 residents. Another example of pork was the Consolidated Appropriations Act, which funded 11,000 projects in just one bill. So that's sort of your hallmark example of a Christmas tree bill. Now, oftentimes, too, you have what's known as log rolling, in which members of Congress support another member's pet project in return for support on his or her own project. So you scratch my back, I scratch your back. So that, again, is a major criticism. Also, criticisms... Uh, involve earmarks where part of a spending bill that provides money for a specific project or location which is tied to pork so uh, typically you might have earmarks for a particular project and as a result that becomes pork and that of course more spending uh, that has become a major criticism of congress within recent years all right so the final stages of a bill the president of course can sign it can veto the bill um, there's also something called the pocket veto, in which the president has 10 days to act. Without action, the bill would die, so that would force Congress to try to override it. Now, line item vetoes, uh, that would be the power of the executive branch to veto certain sections of a bill. This is unconstitutional for the president, but some states, for example, like New Jersey, actually have a line item veto where the president, or the I should say rather the governor, would look through a bill and would literally cross off things that he or she did not like while maybe allowing other things to proceed through, as you see in this political cartoon here. And the final thing that a president can do is write signing statements. So this is where a president can write positive or negative comments concerning a law. So let's say that a president did not agree with a, a bill or thought maybe certain aspects of the bill were unconstitutional or may not be enforced, but still wants the bill to become law the president can add his or her opinion on the bill. Some presidents use this more often than others. Bush 150 times, Clinton 300 times. Okay, so before we actually get back to this review question, I just want to again just reinforce how a bill becomes law from this graphic. Again, the bill is going to originate either in the House or the Senate. But remember, if it deals with anything with taxation, it's beginning in the House. If it originates in the Senate, right, it, it's going to be assigned to a committee. And then after it gets out of committee, if it is so lucky to do so, because we know most of the time it's going to be pigeonholed or tabled and forgotten about, it will then be assigned or approved by the leadership and then will be scheduled for the full Senate. Or if it originated in the House, it will then uh, go to the Rules Committee in which rules will be attached. Things, for example, time limits, there is no filibuster in the House, and then it will be scheduled for a full vote for the House or the Senate. And then once that is ironed out between, or once it passes both the House as well as the Senate, it will be ironed out in the conference committee. And once it gets out of conference, it will then go to another vote in the full Senate or the full House, and then action must be taken by the president. And that is in the form of a veto. It could also be a signing statement in terms of approving it. Or of course, there's the pocket veto where you're going to let the bill die, but then again, the uh, Congress can always override that with a two-thirds uh, override. All right, so let's uh, end with a review question. So which of the following is a unique power held by members of the Senate? Take a moment to look through it. And of course, as we just mentioned, if you said the ability to filibuster, you are correct. If you said control of the veto, will both the House and the Senate have that uh, authority? Control of the appropriations process, certainly House does have that control as well. Uh, the power to impeach actually begins in the House, not the Senate, interestingly enough. An ability to work with a clearly defined constituency that also pertains to the House and the Senate. So the answer, of course, is the ability to filibuster. And of course, you can always 
override that in within the Senate with cloture. 